What's up guys, it's time for a Q&A response video from a thread I posted this week. It was posted on the 26th, so it's been a few days, but just now I'm getting around to it. So let's get to the questions here. Um, several good ones. All right. So let's see. Basal insulin dose for beta cell burnout, or what would you recommend if it occurred? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean... A basal insulin could be a possible solution here. Uh, a really good listen would be go back and listen to some of Colette Nelson's interviews. She does with she does one with uh, Dave Palumbo, one with Advices Radio, I believe. There might be more. Maybe probably some stuff on her own as well. But uh, typically, she she gives a typical starting dose as far as weight to um, weight to IU ratio, but. I mean, most people can start low in the four to five ish range with a basal um, twice a day. Technically, I mean, a lot of people are usually talking about Lantus, which is supposed to be 24 hours, but it's more like 12 to 16 or so. So you could really do it twice a day. Um, so that dose twice a day, and then you know reassess your um, your blood sugar levels from there. You know, fasted or post uh, post carb meal you could do it do it both ways excuse me but that would be one possible solution but when you're looking at it you know kind of think about why are think about the other variables in the situation are you getting to a point where maybe you simply need to do a, a mini cut in your diet you need to go into a calorie deficit maybe look at your body fat do you have are you accumulating too much body fat um do you even need to keep going in a surplus? Because typically a calorie deficit will solve the issue as well just by giving them a break, giving insulin production a break, especially if you're lowering uh, carbohydrates down. So just kind of see, you know, look at it from both sides of the coin here. Maybe you just need to back off, um, do a mini cut and clean it up that way. Or maybe you're still in a good position to keep going in a surplus and then in which case the basal insulin might be a little better option. And then you can always adjust it up, you know, up or down one IU in each dose as you go. Um, it's, you know, obviously with that, it's it's such a slow trickling in effect that a little error one or two up or down is not really a huge deal, but um, pretty easy to adjust. So next question. <clears throat> Best type of massage for bodybuilders and frequency so frequency is really just going to depend on budget you know you could if you could get a massage once a week that would be awesome but it's not really realistic for a lot of people so as far as type goes um <clears throat> i mean the biggest thing is having someone that's knowledgeable about muscle insertions and origins and figuring out the root of of the issues you know when you're looking at one area that's really tight all the time, you know, maybe it's like a pec insertion or something along those lines, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it originates there. It might be on your back on the opposite side, you know, so you need someone that's good with anatomy and um, the origins and insertions to really figure that stuff out. That's That would be first and foremost. And as far as type goes, I mean, NMT is pretty common. That's like your deep tissue type of massage, that's going to be a pretty common option for a lot of people. And then ART also, the active release. Um, I mean, those are probably going to be two main ones. And both of them could be beneficial if, you know, if you have a good therapist. So, you know, really either option or um, there's some other special techniques you can throw in things like Gratzen and stuff like that. Uh, but the ART and the NMT are two of the more common types but it's going to kind of be, you know, condition specifics uh, in terms of what you need. So <clears throat> let's see. Based on what you experimented uh, last prep, do you feel taking very high carb refeed smaller to a two day refeed was more beneficial in speeding up fat loss or as well as increasing leptin? Okay, so in the last prep, what he's mentioning is my as prep went on, my refeeding strategy became a little bit longer. Like I would do two, two day refeeds or, th or three day refeeds starting higher and, and tapering the carbs down as the refeed, as, as the days went on. And, uh, 
versus a traditional one meal or one day or whatever it might be. So as far as leptin goes, typically to get a, any kind of really good effect on leptin, it's going to take more than one day. So that's why you see things like a, a mini, um, whatever you want to call it, a reset week. If you know if you start prep early enough and you stall out mid prep and you have that luxury of being able to do a week at maintenance or just above maintenance where you can reset uh, leptin levels and get metabolic rate up. That stuff doesn't. It does. It can happen to some extent in a day, and I, some people are going to argue that it can't. But I mean, you obviously see beneficial effects. You see in people all the time, so it obviously it's happening to some extent. But when you have someone that's on extremely low calories and responds good to the really cyclical approach, like I was using, super low calories and then the larger refeeds, more extended, then yeah, I mean, it's from a research standpoint, it's gonna you're gonna see that uh, that's gonna have more effect on leptin than a shorter refeed and it's not necessarily that i'm taking uh taking more um total carbs in it's just that i'm spreading them out a little bit so i'm in a slight surplus for a few days at a time versus only a day or six hours or eight hours <clears throat> let's see is there really heart enlargement when using just test what compounds other than growth hormone can cause it is weakening of the heart through using a real risk or is it something the media has used okay so this is going to be dose dependent so testosterone if you're looking at like a replacement dose you know something that's 150 200 milligrams or 100 milligrams or whatever it might be just to keep you in normal ranges of keep your levels in normal range no there's probably not going to be really any issues with that because that's where your body's supposed to be naturally anyhow um in a really high dose sure well, the heart is a muscle it can grow you know so heart enlargement of course that's going to happen um and so it's the same yeah any compound that's going to make a muscle grow could potentially make your heart grow and you would find and also a person that has uh that has high demand on their heart as far as like, you know, exercise goes to, if you were to look at those people after they had passed away and, you know, look at their heart, it's, it's going to be bigger than a, a normal person, sedentary person's heart typically. Now, to some extent, I mean, that's not like, it's not necessarily weakening. You might have a strong heart, but, um, obviously abusing that, uh, could cause issues. So, weakening of the heart i mean yeah enlargement's not good i don't know if that's what you mean by weakening but it could certainly be an issue with abuse so uh the dose is the poison really <clears throat> let's see a topic of blasting versus cruising so this is from um, one of my uk buddies here and they they talk about that a lot, so which is better? Um, usually, okay, so I know the idea of cruising can be intimidating just because, you know, it's a permanent thing. But typically, it, typically if you do cycles continuously, then chances are maybe you recover once or twice or even three times through a PCT, but... Chances are it's not going to keep happening. Recovery will get worse. You eventually won't be able to recover, and you're going to need to um, be on a replacement dose anyhow. And uh, you know, so with the cruising, you're basically doing what's already inevitable, just sooner. Uh, and you know, you could argue that the constant up and down isn't really a good thing. Tr trying to do PCT, so. Most people, you know, just plan to commit, and that's that's that. You know, I I really don't think I really don't think it's um it it's going to be bad to do it either way. But eventually, like I said, it's you're going to be on anyhow. And I think just from psychological standpoint of the roller coaster, and probably from you know from a health standpoint to some extent, it's you're probably going to be better off just cruising. Uh, so just, you know, know that that's what you're getting into and, uh, 
and uh, that's a that's a big decision. So, what's the real difference between probiotics and digestive enzymes, and can your body become dependent on these supplements? Um, which would you recommend? Okay, so probiotics are the good, quote unquote, good bacteria in your uh, gastrointestinal tract, and then digestive enzymes would be enzymes there that break down uh, certain food components, whether it be carbohydrates or certain sugars or fibers or whatever it is. Um, and those even start in your mouth. We hear digestion starts in your mouth. Well, there's enzymes there, so enzymes all over, all the way down through. So uh, one's a bacteria and one's an enzyme. That's really the difference, but as far as becoming dependent on them, um, I don't think that there's any reason you would necessarily become dependent on them, but I think it's important to understand why you're using them. And, um, with the probiotics, I think there's just, that's just an environmental thing. You know, if, if you have, we're in an environment that might not support proper gut microbiome and take in things, ingest things that kind of destroy that balance. And that's why the probiotics can be beneficial um, and that's person dependent. I think some of it's just genetic too. I think some of it, how good your gut microbiome is naturally is a genetic thing also, but obviously there's, you know, what you ingest, uh, plays a huge role in that. And if you have a lot of inflammation and things along those lines, but it's, uh, the digestive enzyme thing. That's more so if let's say you are ingesting a large amount of food, well, you already produce enzymes and your body will produce certain enzymes to pretty much keep up with whatever you're taking in. But think about abusing those enzymes over and over and over again. Eventually you may not be able to produce enough to uh, digest what you need to. So that's where the additional supplemental enzymes come into play. It kind of gives your body a break and provides it with what it needs to, to break the foods down because it's, you know, eating a certain amount of food every day for years on years and years on end is demanding. Um, it, there's no, there's no doubt about that. So that's where the enzymes can come into play. But again, it's person dependent. Some people never need them. Some people, um, you could argue that a person with a high metabolic rate is probably going to have more digestive enzymes. Anyhow, the two kind of would go hand in hand, more food, more digestive enzymes. So, it's not something that I always recommend, but it's certainly something that's helpful to some people if they're eating an amount of food that is unnatural to them or they're in a caloric surplus for a really long time and their body's having to constantly try to keep up, if that makes sense. So let's see. Thoughts on M-Trend pre-workout? Okay, so I know some people like the M-Trend or, or um, base compounds and things like that that are basically instant acting. You know, it's it's more of a performance and aggression benefit than anything. You're not going to get a lot of hypertrophy from something that is in and out so quickly. I mean, that's not to say that you won't get anything, um, but you know, it's not it's not really setting up a long sustainable environment for hypertrophy, and they're still very toxic, and they're still. Um, still going to have side effects. So to me, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you're a performance athlete and you're trying to, you know, a powerlifter or a strongman and it's for peaking for an event or at the event or something along those lines. I just, I, I get the appeal. Like I understand, I get the appeal that people, it's like, oh, it makes you feel really good and aggressive and so on and so forth. But I just don't think that the benefits really there that much from the hypertrophy standpoint. So for a physique um, athlete, I really not something that I um, would mess with, just to be completely honest. Does consuming BCAAs negate the effects of intermittent fasting? Um, and you say I work out first thing in the morning. So I'm assuming you're taking the BCAAs around training, or <clears throat> you could put EAAs in that slot if you wanted to. But now it's not really going to negate the effects. I mean, intermittent fasting is not. Um, not ketosis either. So it's not like it's kicking you out of ketosis. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's, you're technically not fasted, but I mean, the BCAAs or, or the EAAs or whatever, are pretty much gonna, um, get into the muscle pretty quick, just 
short a bit of fuel for the workout, you'll be back in a fasted state pretty quick. Um, so technically, yeah, it's going to take you out of a quote-unquote fasted state, but it's not to say that it's going to hurt. You're not going to get the benefits from the IF diet. I mean, it's still going to give you benefits. Um, you're really splitting hairs there. It's not. It's but you know if you sat there and drank on BCAs throughout the whole entire fasted period, like in a gallon jug or something, then of course I mean you're gonna be producing insulin the whole time. So that yeah, that's and you know your blood sugar is gonna be moving around. So that's probably not a good idea. But just a from in a workout situation, I wouldn't even worry about it. And then one that I have trained faster use IF like that, I don't even think twice about it. <laughs> Thoughts on CB1 receptor and antagonist to treat leptin resistance and do you believe leptin resistance affects weight loss beyond the hunger increase so cb1 receptor antagonist is a cannabinoid uh, receptor antagonist i don't know a ton about them i know some about them just because it's not really something a lot of people use so essentially the research from what i know says that they um they help decrease hunger and they help uh, they help lower body weight so I don't know though I mean is the if you're looking at the study I would have to really read the studies closer I don't know how controlled it was so if you're decreasing hunger and then naturally the people are going to eat less so that would make sense that doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, they're doing anything to actually burn body fat it's if they're decreasing hunger and you eat less then you're in a calorie deficit and you're going to lose weight so you know could just be appetite suppressant effects but yeah i mean the the literature shows that they help so that's you know, but you just don't see a lot of people use them um nor am i really sure um where you would get them or what they're comprised of entirely let's see <laughs> leptin yeah and leptin resistance yeah i I think i think a a leptin resistance is part of just part of the whole um storm of metabolic damage if you want to call it that um one of the possible downsides once you create that whole slew of issues and it would it would certainly mess with um your metabolism as a whole and hunger for sure couple more if possible could I add one more question sure all right let's see wanted to know if you think your digestion ever needs a deload to speak of same way your CNS needs a break when you think you're pushing okay when you think you're pushing food too hard while a week or so just lightening up food is beneficial been on my mind for a while and after I implemented it, it did wonders uh, yeah you could do that You certainly could. I mean, that's kind of part of going to the, look at the whole mini cut scenario. It's not just about fat gain either. It might be about you going into a deficit might also be just to lessen the burden on your uh, gastrointestinal tract and the inflammation and all those things. So that could certainly be um, one reason to do it. Though there's other things that you could implement. Like if if you're someone that has to push food really hard and you know, you can't, you can't really gain any kind of good size without it. And it's a burden on your GI tract and you can, you know, you can do it for a little while, but then digestion kind of gets hard to manage even with supplement, you know, the right supplementation and food selection and all that stuff. Uh, then you could either do deload for a week like that, like you're mentioning, uh, or you could just implement fasting periods, which I've done with people more so in recent time and had a lot of success with it works really well for the inflammatory part of it, the insulin sensitivity part of it, and obviously like the digestion, of course. Um, so that's something that you could implement, and it's going to be different from person to person. You know, let's say, um, you know, maybe I'll have someone uh, do. They have a free meal on Saturdays, or they have a refeed, or or it's part of their plan, or whatever. Then maybe on Sundays I have them fast half of the day. And they only eat three meals in that next day, or they only eat two meals in that next day, and it's just protein and some veggies, and but in a you know smaller quantity, um, you know that that could be the fast. Or I had one person that actually had fast the whole day, uh, 
you know, it, you know, you also have to think is that someone that's if they're trying to gain gain muscle and be in a calorie surplus and they already have to eat a lot. If you're fasting a whole entire day, are they going to lose? Are they going to lose like you know five pounds in that day? Well, they might lose a little bit of weight back again. But the thing is, it's going to be mostly glycogen, really, and some water. But it's not like it's they're going to lose all their hard-earned muscle gains or anything. So think about trying, you know, shorter fasting periods like that or possibly a full deload week. You could certainly do it either way. <clears throat> all right, one more. Oral Winstrol, empty stomach or with food, and is it better to split doses in two times per day or three, like 20 pre, 28 hours later, 10, 8 hours later? Um <clears throat> You could do it with or without. Um, it's methylated, so it won't really matter. And splitting. Yeah, splitting up into two would be a, a pretty decent idea. I mean, you could still do one. Two would be good. I don't... I mean, you could do three. I don't know that... I really think it's going to be massively beneficial to do three, but at least two would it would be a decent idea. And, guys, I think that is it. Those are really good questions. So thanks for all the questions, guys. That was Q&A from July 26th. And we will talk to you again next time.